No worries. Someone said they could hear a keyboard and left but not right, maybe. Oh, I just heard it now. All right, all of our audio should be coming through now. Mm -hmm. I think the audio that you were connected to, Ryan, on Zoom is not the same as what I'm streaming with, but everybody should be able to hear me now. So please let me know if it's all coming through. Should be. Um, <laughs> so sorry about that little bit of that technical difficulty, difficulty there, everybody. Um, thank you uh, for everyone that has uh, been waiting to join. We are joined here by Ryan Sepper. I'll, I'll just say it all again. My name is Jaron Dorman, and uh, I'm the design community manager at Gravity Sketch. Um, Ryan's going to be showing us some, uh, some of his work and vehicles and uh, some character stuff. Um, he's going to be taking us through also his workflow of going from Gravity Sketch to Fusion 360. Um, and so if you're interested in that sort of workflow of CAD, uh, CAD pipeline stuff, um, you know, especially from Gravity Sketch to, to that, uh, this will be great. Um, and yeah, so we're actually going to start face to face and then we're going to go into VR and we're going to look at some of his work and then we're going to come back face to face and, uh, and talk some more. He's going to show us more of his workflow. So um, feel free to ask any questions during the live. Um, I myself or Ryan will uh, will do our best to answer any of your questions that you have coming through. Um, again, sorry about the little audio issue there. There's just some, just some connection uh, issues here, but uh, we're all good now. It looks like everybody can, everybody's saying that they can hear us, which is good. So, um, well, Ryan, uh, I'll, uh, I'll let you take it away. Why don't you just share um, with everyone uh, just a little bit about yourself, who you are, and, uh, and what you do. Sure. Yeah, I'm a uh, concept designer, 3D concept designer. Uh, I'm located in Los Angeles right now, and uh, I've worked on sort of a wide variety of projects. I've done uh, a little bit of design, uh, military design for the real world. And then I've also done some more entertainment design based things for uh, some films and television shows. And um, so being freelance kind of gives me a wide variety of projects and things. So I like to balance sort of um, real world technical stuff with um, a little bit more uh, sci-fi entertainment type of stuff. So um, yeah, and um, I have mostly a 3D centric workflow Obviously, I still um, draw and uh, do things like that occasionally, but most of my professional work uh, has been um, heavily relying on 3D workflows and rendering and um, just rapidly um, creating models for uh, whether it's manufacturing or concept design or prototypes or, or uh, uh, 3D printing, mold making, casting for entertainment, all that stuff. So um, yeah. I kind of have a, a mixed bag in terms of skill sets, but I think that um, allows me to have uh, a lot of just interesting uh, approaches to things. So, yeah, um, and I guess we're going to jump right into the XJet project. So this is a, a pretty long project for me, and I guess uh, I should share my screen. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Where do I go? Is that through Zoom, right? Yeah. Let's see. Sorry, I'm like terrible with Zoom. I always no I worries. The menus or something. There's uh, the there's a little green share screen button at the bottom. Right. That should be in. The, oh, okay. I got it now. It was wasn't showing one. Uh, I had it minimized. Okay. Oh, it said uh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Alrighty. Well, let's uh, let's 
take care of that. Should be able to do it now. Yes. All right, everyone can see, can you see my screen here? Yeah, perfect. Okay, excellent. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna briefly run through this. Um, these are the 2D renders, and then once we get into VR, we'll jump into looking at this in a 3D space, and then um, I can sort of demonstrate along the way. So I wanted to just start, this project was super long. It started out totally different. I was actually making a helicopter at one point, and I didn't really like the direction of that project, so then I ended up switching it to uh, the X-Jet. And so the X-Jet was a um, fictional aircraft that is used by the X-Men, for anyone who's familiar with the films or comic books. Um, so I really wanted to sort of do my own take on it, which, which sort of like my thought process being like, uh, I think this started around the time or shortly after Disney had acquired Fox, and so that meant that X-Men was gonna be in Marvel movies, and so, uh, this was sort of like my take of how I thought it could look or potentially um, might look in that world. So uh, one of the things I did was uh, traditionally the X-Jet is based on the SR-71 Blackbird aircraft, which is a um, high altitude, high speed aircraft. And I wanted to switch it up and change sort of the primary form language that I was based on. So I based this on a uh, F-117A Nighthawk, which is uh, like a stealth fighter, very faceted looking and sort of triangular. And um, so I'm just going to jump in. Uh, this was like one of my favorite views. It shows a lot of the plane from a top down view. And uh, when designing something like this, I'm looking at it from all angles, from top, front, side, and um, really just trying to make it look really cool and um, give it the, the sort of uh, feel that I want from all angles, because sometimes you could design something in like an orthographic view and then you change the camera, and you realize this isn't really working. So um, in general, it's pretty straightforward. I imagine the engine and stuff would be back here. This is sort of a, a feature that I'll get into a little bit later, but it's like this uh, gyro stabilized um, clear dome that someone could sit in. And, uh, and yeah, so the idea was just to create this inside and out. That was something that was really critical. I wanted uh, to be able to show the aircraft's exterior as well as kind of keep drawing the viewer in. So like, just keep uh, keep taking steps closer to the vehicle and realizing like, hey, the door is open, you can step inside. Everything on the inside is designed and really uh, approach this like it was you know gonna be manufactured, a set that was made for a film potentially. Um, even though for film production, the set would probably only be you know, probably wouldn't be all the wings and stuff, it might only be the center portion, but uh, I approached it as uh, as uh, far as I could in terms of detail. So I'll just jump through here. Uh, you can see some of the some of the aircraft, some of this signage was like, I took the, I think this is the Air Force symbol and I put like the X-Men symbol just to kind of give it this sort of uh, military, but like X-Men vibe was kind of what I was going for. And uh, you can see there's, a lot of reference to the Nighthawk uh, stealth plane on here and um, the sort of cargo door ramp here that you can enter. And then uh, one thing, it's really subtle, but um, maybe not that subtle, but uh, I, uh, I wanted to put some lighting underneath here. So the lighting that I put would form an X on the ground. And so like, these are the things that I'm thinking of. Um, I didn't want to have like a bunch of X's all over the place, but I thought, be really cool if there was a way to tie in, you know, the theme of X-Men um, in with uh, the design itself, which was really important to me. Uh, going along, here's the front view. And uh, again, this was, there was like, like I said, I wanted to look at all of the views, really get something that um, showcased the, the design of the stealth, um, the stealth plane, as well as just something new that's felt um, different and yet still was believable enough to um, something that could actually fly still. That was something too I struggled with was, um, you know, if you make like wings too chunky, it doesn't really look aerodynamic. And so there was all a balance of trying to get, you know, something that looks aerodynamic and uh, things like that. And uh, just looking at this view, you can see, uh, let me bring up. you can see like, again, here's like certain points where I'm like, I'm trying to put X's in there, but not hit you over the head with the idea that there, there yeah. are X's in it, you know, just 
just subtle things. So again, the X there, you can see that the X on the ground a little bit better in this view. Um, trying to think if there's anything else. Uh, uh, I can pull up uh, some reference I have too as well, but we'll just keep moving along. Um, and again, this was set up the idea of this whole, the order of these slides and sort of how I presented this was um, you're kind of slowly walking towards and into the aircraft. So you can see this might be, you know, the camera view of someone approaching the aircraft and, um, and things like that. To so get a little bit closer, you can see start, start to see some of the interior. And this is where putting in all of the work of uh, doing the interior really paid off because now you get these really cool views of like an open door and you can see inside and see like, hey, there's, you know, there's more going on here. Yeah. So I think this next shot will jump us to the inside of the aircraft. So now we're inside and um, and there's a couple couple things going on here. So I had a couple different type of seat setups. So these were imagined to be like more um, technician seats. So it's like a keyboard, there's a screen here and they would, they would kind of collapse down and slide into the wall when not in use, which is kind of shown on this side. And, um, and then back here, this is call it the mobile Cerebro unit. So for anyone familiar with X-Men, uh, it's traditionally like this giant uh, sphere, kind of like egg shaped in the basement of the X mansion. And um, for this, I wanted to, to allow it to be inside of the aircraft and this way my thought process was, and again, this is like something that you might not even get from just looking at these renders, but my thought process was from a story perspective, uh, you know, a character like Professor X, he's traditionally, if you watch the movies, uh, I rewatched them while I was working on this, like a lot of times he's like out of commission, he gets like, uh, kidnapped or like, you know, uh, poisoned through Cerebro and he's kind of like left behind in, in the action. So I thought this would be a great way to include his character. Um, he can be really centered in the action sequences. So we'll keep jumping on here and you could you could see, uh, I put these doors open and closed. This was something that was important for me too to show. The reference for this door, I looked at, I think it was, uh, Bane vaults, and they have um, these uh, these very like uh, repet to give a sense of, sort of like security and strength. So that was the idea there. And uh, here's the, here's the view. So we kind of just rotated around 180 degrees for the camera. And uh, now we're looking at the front of the aircraft towards the uh, cockpit and pilot area and crew section. And um, all of this stuff, all of the interior was really heavily relied upon Gravity Sketch to get a sense of how well you could fit inside of it, how well you could see uh, the viewport of the pilot, how well the pilots can see where the pilots can reach their controls and things like that. So all along the way, I was jumping back and forth from uh, Fusion to Gravity Sketch and back and forth, just kind of bouncing off uh, ideas and different ideas that I had and what might work and what might not. Uh, so you can see too, it was important to me. I wanted to showcase some different lighting. So this might be the lighting when you know, you're getting on board or exiting the aircraft. And then during flight, you know, the cabin lights might be dim, just like the real aircraft and um, things like that. So jump in, get a little bit closer and uh, you could see some of the controls I put in here. Again, these are all really critical to have a gravity sketch. So I could, you know, I could literally virtually sit in the seat and put my hand out and see where I wanted to, where I wanted the throttle to be. Okay, are these buttons big enough and things like that? Uh, yeah. How, do, how does the view look? Can you see out of this thing and things like that? So that really helped uh, along the way. And, uh, you know, if you're working in CAD, you know, you're working on a screen, it's very hard to get a sense of what you can actually see once you're sitting in it. So yeah. uh, it was really invaluable to be able to sit and stand and, and move around virtually through this uh, to get a sense of if it could really work in, in real life. Uh, so just some more views of the crew. Of the, these are just more crew seats. Um, back to the technician seat. And then we kind of take a, a few into the back. So this is the Cerebro seat. And um, there's a lot, there is a lot of this project that I sort of had um, thought up and worked on, but I hadn't really fully developed in the end. And uh, it had taken such a long time, I kind of just said, okay, these are the things I can work on. And this has to be cut, be cut and stuck as is. But um, the way I imagine this is this seat right here, this is actually Professor X's wheelchair. And so when he's oh, wow. gone, there, there's actually another seat 
behind this that folds down. And again, like this is one of those things where uh, I really don't like the idea of telling people without showing them, but there is so much stuff that um, kind of got cut out of this. I just wanted to take this time to sort of touch on that. So the idea was that there is this tracked system running throughout the whole interior of the aircraft. And um, that, you know, there would be sort of like a, almost like a Roomba with arms attached to it that would uh, allow him to move throughout the aircraft. Because if you imagine someone in a wheelchair on a jet, um, that's probably not going to end well unless they're really secured in. Yeah. So my idea was um, to have this sort of rail system that would allow him to lock in and uh, and to work. Uh, that's so be able cool. To move throughout the aircraft. So that's something in the future, maybe if I have some time to go back, I want to revisit that and expand on that more because I really think that's that's uh, like a really powerful like story driven moment that I haven't really touched on. But you can see a little bit closer here, we're sort of in the Cerebro unit and the idea being, you know, it scans his sort of, uh, his brain waves to amplify his, his powers to uh, read minds and things like that. And uh, you can see a little bit closer up of how this chair right here separates and then this section here rotates down. So the idea being like another mutant could use this and uh, and it could be just another seat if it needed to be and things like that. So real quickly, before uh, we jump into VR, I'm going to go to, uh, where is it? Fusion, oh, here we go. Um, We'll get to the spacesuit in a second. Uh, I just wanted to jump through some of the works in progress images. So this was the very initial gravity sketch model. And you can see it's kind of, uh, it's all made out of like mesh and surfaces. And I didn't really have a clear idea. There was a lot of things changing at the time. And then uh, I got more, slowly started to get more and more uh, figuring out how things are gonna work, the scale of things you can actually see this mannequin in here, like it's totally out of scale. Like at, at first I wasn't building this in real scale and I was just kind of putting things in there and you could see how um, we have a mannequin here in more of a proper scale, I believe, how things change. Mm, yeah. And uh, and it just keeps getting, keeps getting developed. And you can see like here, very simple, like blank surfaces. And then I start going more and more in detail, starting to put some, some features on the exterior. So uh, sketching, uh-huh. So um, just for the clarity of people watching and, and for myself, um, mm -hmm. you said you started with that gravity sketch model. So mm -hmm. um, did you, it, I'm assuming you basically used that as like an underlay the entire time then. Yeah, um, exactly. As you were so modeling. this was like the blueprint. And at the time uh, when I first did this, this was about almost a year ago I started this, uh, there was no sub D modeling. So if there was, I could have almost converted all of these surfaces but because they're mesh, um, triangulated mesh, uh, Fusion has a little bit of difficulty converting that. So it's a little technical, but uh, basically this mesh doesn't really work well with CAD design. So um, I essentially had to recreate it, which definitely took some time, but it also allowed me to really refine the shapes and say, okay, is this really working? Is this what I want? And so it was like, yeah, it was almost like when you do a drawing and then you do, you put like tracing paper over it, you clean it up more and you keep cleaning it up. That was essentially the same thing I was doing. I was just doing it with 3D. Um, so you can see here, like even the chairs, like the chairs are a little out of scale. Yeah. And these seats were from uh, the previous helicopter project that I was doing. Uh, so I was able to just bring those seats in. And uh, there's actually, uh, let's see if this loads up. I'll take a second. It was actually, so this was the helicopter project that I did and it oh, never wow. got finished, but you could see I was basing all of the scale sort of off of that helicopter so that I kind of had a sense, okay, this will work um, for the scale I need. And um, yeah, so I just kept, kept working and eventually this is gonna be, this right here is the final model that you see in rendering. And uh, you could see, is these are, and it was less about um, defining these major shapes and more about just going into gravity sketch, drawing some notes of what needed to be revised, what needed to be changed, and then uh, and making those changes in CAD. So I, I essentially started using it as almost like uh, like three D notes that I could use and move around the scene. And um, yeah, so this is this is a section view. Hide this, you can see the the full thing. Sort of see like 
here I'm drawing out, you know, the stairs, how I want them to work. Uh, you can see, actually, here's something I never Im implemented was like a different type of handrail. Uh, I had this idea for like these like straps that you could use to enter and exit the vehicle. Uh, a lot of the ceiling was actually used. Uh, I actually had to use Gravity Sketch to figure out how things were going to connect. And you can kind of see here, like some of these don't fully match up, but you could see like the idea of where the, the ceiling panel would go started yeah. with Gravity Sketch with these lines. And then once I'm in Fusion, I could kind of uh, make a clear picture of what I wanted. Uh, I imagine that that part probably was what took so much time was was matching everything up so that it, yeah. it fit together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, what is that saying? Like, it's like the 2080 rule, like the first, is, I'm gonna mess it up. The first 80% takes 20% of your time and the final 20% takes 80%. So that's, <laughs> um, that's totally true. You know, like yeah. the subtle things like putting a gap between these panels, like is really critical when you render it. Because if you don't put a gap there, um, you're not going to get a very realistic like line in your renders. The yeah. geometry is kind of merged. So just subtle things like that going in, putting gaps in. Uh, one more thing too I want to touch on before we jump into VR uh, was the, the seats. The seat belt was really critical uh, in VR because it's a very organic shape that you can't really do too well. And you can do it in CAD, but it's not um, it's not the ideal ideal tool. So the first thing I did was I sketched out, the, I brought the seat into VR, sketched out how I would imagine the seat belts looking. And as you can see, they're really like kind of messy and not that clean. But then as I go on, um, you can see what those, those models turn into and yeah. see how they uh, were really heavily utilized to make uh, them look like that. So yeah, that is the project That's almost amazing. as a whole. Uh, Yes, real quickly, I, I don't know. I also have this. I have to really give a shout out to Pure Ref. This is one of my favorite like image uh, boards. So this is what I use to gather all my reference. And um, there's a ton of stuff in here, uh, just in like UI elements. And this is a great piece of software too that I use all the time. You said it's and, called Pure uh, Ref? Pure Ref, yeah. I think it's free, but uh, you can also like donate to get it. But like uh, what I love about it is it's kind of, uh, you can put images in here, you can zoom in, you can set up boards however you want. And you can kind of see, this is how I, the whole time I'm modeling, building things, I'm making a visual library of things I can reference. So for like the, the dashboard in the cockpit details, I'm looking at these, I'm looking at military jets, I'm grabbing, you know, UI reference for the screen. And uh, I would always have this basically on my second monitor. This was like a screen grab from uh, Zero Dark Thirty. I did a paint over. I was like, th this is kind of the feel I want for my X-Men. So this is like, <laughs> turn this guy into Cyclops, you know, just like a real quick doodle, yeah. but just to give me a vibe of what I'm trying to build in the end. And, uh, you know, stuff like, what do pedals on an aircraft look like? like I have no idea. So you got to look that up, you know, see, yeah. see what they look like, get some reference and, um, yeah, I, I went down a rabbit hole with this stuff. I mean, I even got to the point where I was like, oh, these are what the suits, like inspiration for suits. And I was like, all right, this is this is kind of where I drew the line. I was like, I got to focus on the aircraft. But um, yeah. yeah, you can kind of see different movies. I'm looking at, you know, Tron, Jurassic World, like all of these references are, are building up in my head. And then um, I'm using those along the way to kind of figure out how I want things to look. Uh, so yeah, with that, I think we can jump into... Uh, we can jump into VR and we can kind of look at, at what I've been working on in there and, and uh, review from that. Awesome. Thank, well, thank you for showing us all that process, Ryan. That was really, really cool to see. Um, I know someone asked, this is somewhat related. They said, can we, uh, um, they said, hey, Ryan, big fan here. Can we expect merchandise soon with this concept design on a t-shirt? <laughs> <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be pretty cool. Um, yeah. I don't know, maybe, they're actually, you know, I, I was thinking there would be some really cool, um, I don't know, you've probably seen them like more like old school photos of sort of like a section view of an aircraft, like a pencil drawing or like line work. And so I was thinking it might be kind of cool to do like more of a mechanical uh, uh, look. And so like you could do something yeah. with this like wireframe or like a section view and get like, you know, kind of like a cool poster out of it. But Absolutely. Um, yeah, that would be yeah. cool. Maybe, maybe in the future. Uh, I can get some of that going. But, well, that's, uh, a, that's yeah. incredible work. Um, and it's, it's really cool seeing the process, like how you went back and forth between Gravity Sketch and Fusion. 
and how, like you said, you know, you, you take a sketch and you refine it, you draw on top of the rough sketch and that's, you know, and, um, and then I thought it was interesting how you, when you, once you got more towards the end, towards a more refined model, you, you use gravity sketch almost as like an annotation tool at that yeah. point to, yeah, that was um, really powerful. Yeah. I, I gotta, I gotta address this. So I want to ask real quick, Toby samples, where did the X-Men go pee? Toby, <laughs> believe it or not, I put a bathroom in this aircraft and it was something Amazing. I was like, I'm not spending much attention on this, but it's right here. Uh, uh, this is this is the bathroom here. It's there's like I think seven feet of height in here, and uh, I didn't. I was like I'm not spending any time modeling like a toilet or a sink, but uh, yes, <laughs> there is a bathroom in the X Jet. Uh, that was one of the things. That's I, awesome. There's one on each side. I was like one could be a utility closet with like suits or hardware or whatever. The other one is a bathroom. But yes, I uh, I did factor that in. It just wasn't uh, a primary thing. I That's awesome. Is, yeah, it's, it just, yeah, yeah. It just it really adds here. to the the believability of it too, you know, that you thought of every single detail. So Yeah. You know, I was, the idea was like this is a fast jet. They could get, you know, I looked at the SR seventy one times and I think you could get something crazy like New York to London in like two hours or I don't know, something wow. insane. So you wouldn't be in it for long, but if you needed to go, there's somewhere to go. So just wanted to touch on that. <laughs> awesome. Well, um I guess we're gonna hop over to VR now and uh Ryan's gonna take us we're gonna have a little bit of a deep dive into um, his work uh, in 3D and VR, and uh, look at an, another sort of like side project he's been doing as well. So, just give us a minute to hop on over the, hop on over there. All right, and I'm starting with my head camera today everyone usually we have the external camera set up um, but uh, today since we're going to be kind of moving around I just figured it'd be better that we just start with the head cam so um, just wait for Ryan to hop in here hey, he's over there <laughs> yeah I teleported too far over here uh, let me get back yeah this is really cool seeing seeing this model uh, in in VR uh, at scale it's, and you got this um, wheelchair here as well, which is cool, Professor. Yeah, S. That, that was one of the elements. See, that kind of got like cut out just due to time. But um, yeah, there's there's tons of stuff that got sort of cut out. But um, that's just uh, how it goes sometimes. So um, let's see, where are you? Are you in here in the VR space? I'm actually inside of the uh, X Jet. <laughs> oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> Yeah, so this, I mean, honestly, this is like one of the most amazing aspects to me of VR in general. And um, I mean, here we are, you're in, a, you're in a different part of the country. I'm in Los Angeles and we can share a 3D object and both be in a virtual space uh, at the same time and sort of explore uh, and problem solve. Like, I, I just like think this is a really great tool and uh, like especially with COVID going on where face-to-face -face interactions are kind of limited. Uh, this is like, to me, like super amazing. So I think this is like uh, just one of those things that is really like gonna define uh, the future of sort of 3D design and just VR in general. But um, yeah, I mean, there's not much to show beyond what we already looked at, but just um, one of the things like I was saying to be able to sit inside of here and, uh, you know, like I was able to just like sketch out a dashboard to say like, you know, here, I, here's my controls, the throttle's gonna go here, you're gonna sit here. Uh, you can see far enough outside, overhead controls can go here. Um, this is all things that was super critical. And like, I really, I don't know how I would have done this without this tool. And that's why it was so um, critical for me. Like, you know, you can draw on, on 2D and, and work on 3D files, but in the end, you're working off of a screen that's flat and it doesn't give you any sense of, of scale and looking around. But uh, with this, you know, you can just you can just go crazy. And so I was able to just say, you know, OK, like here's where a seat's going to go. Uh, you know, there's a there's one pilot seat, uh, you know, controls. Here's a monitor should be here, uh, you know, all, all that stuff. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, without getting too far into it, even things like the cargo door, I was like, yeah. you know, these doors are a little low. And then I was able to sit like to sit in a virtual wheelchair and be like, oh, yeah, like my head is 
low enough to not hit this. Like this <laughs> works, you know, like that, yeah. that is so valuable. And it's something that, um, you know, those are the types of things when like just on a smaller scale from like 3d printing something or just making something small and, you know, you forget to double check a measurement or something that was colliding in 3d that you didn't see. And then with this, like you can really get a sense of, of just like what this is, if it was to be built for real in a virtual sense. So, um, it's just been really, um, just really valuable, super valuable tool. Yeah, this is, a, this is great. And, and um, there, we've seen several examples of this where uh, I think Airbus um, has had a project uh, where they've, you know, worked with Gravity Sketch designing in aircraft interiors and a lot of the same stuff you're talking about with, you know, seat placement and controls and, you know, is this too short for my head when I'm standing up? Um, you know, all these sort of ergonomical factors, um, you know, can be really worked out pretty intuitive, intuitively in VR. Yeah. Um, yeah, it... And I guess that, that's a good segue actually into a question um, that I want to ask, which is, you know, how do you see VR affecting, uh, you know, changing the world of design? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, like I said, I mean, I really think this is like, uh, as like, like I said, just being able to share a file like imagine it, for example, if you were like an art director or someone, you could you could start looking around this. If this was to be built as a set for a movie, you know, you can be in a totally different part of the world as long as you got internet, and you can say, hey, like show me what the designers have been working on. Uh, I want to see, you know, like like how this is going to work, how we can film it, even from a budget perspective. You can say like, okay, what do we actually have to build? Um, yeah, and the other thing too with VR is, um, I think it also makes the barrier of entry to become a designer, uh, like super easy, literally like, you know, I, I think like back to sort of my design education and I kind of came in at a time when um, 3D was starting to become more dominant and, um, and uh, drawing, obviously drawing is never going to go away. You're always going to need to draw, but um, to be able to show ideas, 3D was becoming more of a, a key feature and, you know, to learn 3D modeling, you need a, deep, a pretty powerful computer, you need software, you need all these sort of tools, you need experience to be able to draw. And right now, like Gravity Sketch, I feel like it combines all of that. And for, you know, the price of a VR headset and Gravity Sketch, you're looking at like $400 and you literally can be designing, you know, all of this stuff. So uh, I think it's just so great that like more people have access to design as well as um, it's just making design and 3D design overall very accessible. And the more accessible it is, the um, just the higher the quality and the, you know, the, there'll be more people doing it, there'll be more competition, more people pushing things further. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm just really excited for it. I just see huge potential with it. And um, I think like everyone who's tried it has really just like enjoyed it. It's one of those things, once you, once you like use it and get it, you really get it. It's kind of hard to, to get for it, like someone who might be watching this on a 2D screen might not really be understanding how um, how valuable it is. But once you're really in it and you can see the scale and see how things move around, um, it's incredible. So yeah, it's it really is putting the power in, in so many more people's hands um, mm -hmm. to just you know just make what's in their minds. Um, yeah, yeah. It's it sounds like almost like. I don't know, like just like crazy that you can like build anything, but literally like you can build anything. You can build a space. I mean, you you built a soundstage here for this interview, like, and I, like I built a plane. Like you can build like anything and have it and share it um, virtually. So I think it's it's just yeah. incredibly powerful. I have just a quick question about the, the X Jet here. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I I would assume that this back end is a uh, propulsion. Mm -hmm. um, is it a VTOL aircraft or is it is it more of like a runway kind of traditional takeoff? Yeah, that's a great question. And honestly, that's something, again, that kind of got cut. Um, what I had originally imagined was these fins would sort of articulate and almost like kind of like a lobster tail. So let me, uh, let me sketch that out real quick. So like maybe they would go more down at one point and there would be like jets of air pushing pushing out and then the aircraft could take off vertically and then you'd have these more like uh i guess horizontal thrusters for like speed but um if you if you look at my renders i actually didn't show much of this angle of the aircraft because um 
it just ran out of time. And I thought, you know, people wouldn't uh, people wouldn't see it that much. But actually, that is one thing besides the the wheelchair sort of mechanics of the internals. Um, I did want to sort of refine this. So, in theory, yes, it was supposed to be a VTOL aircraft. Although I I would admit right now it doesn't totally uh, read as that, and it could it could be refined more to look like that. But uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, so I we, I totally. I was just, I um I was kind of assuming it was VTOL. I just didn't see any clear indication like of of how it was um, lifting off. But I could t- yeah. I could totally see it being a VTOL. Just like you said, some sort of downward facing thrust. Yeah, would do the and trick. the idea too, like maybe there would be some something coming from these sort of support wings here that yeah. would uh, have air coming out of them. Yeah, things like that. So it, again, one of those things totally it didn't just got cut because of time, but. Um, you know, it was, it was like, it's there. So if I ever want to come back to this, I have sort of like, well, it it looks amazing. And it's just, it looks so unique too. I just love the stealthy look of it. And I'm assuming, um, you might've mentioned it before, but the really faceted paneling here, Mm -hmm. um, from my knowledge is a, is a, like a stealth tactic actually for Mm -hmm. bouncing off signals. Is that, was that, I'm assuming that was some of your inspiration there. Yeah. I did a little bit of reading about, um, uh, aircraft design. It's actually, there's a pretty interesting history. So what had happened, why, if you look now at stealth planes, they're, I don't think they're very faceted and you might be wondering, well, why were they faceted before and not before? Yeah. And the reality is, um, basically I think in the late sixties, uh, physicists theorized how a, um, a stealth aircraft could be made, but they didn't, the issue was when you make something this faceted, the, aerodynamic stability of it is not that great. It's very hard to fly. Mm. You actually need a computer to fly this plane, which is referred to as fly-by-wire, which means that the buttons you push in the cockpit and the joystick isn't hydraulically moving pistons and stuff inside the plane. It's all being controlled by a computer. Mm. And so at the time, they didn't have the computing power to be able to fly an aircraft like this. And then in the 70s, they started to be able to have computers that could do it. On top of that, they couldn't simulate uh, a curvature, the stealth factor of a curvature of, of a curved plane. So they made it like polygonal, which was easier for their computers to simulate how well radar would interact with it. But nowadays, because computing power has increased, um, the computer is able to simulate how radar waves will bounce off of curved surfaces. And things wow, like that. that's incredible. So yeah, it's pretty crazy how like the technology has advanced to allow the aircraft to work, but I still, I feel like this faceted look almost looks more futuristic because it is so different. Um, yeah. Yeah. So this, this whole front end is really, if you look at a, at a night, uh, I think, yeah, F-117A Nighthawk, you will, this was very heavily, I wouldn't say stolen, but very heavily influenced. And, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and you can see they actually have in my final, there's like these little computer, these little sensors that come out of the front that kind of look like, like teeth. They're like uh, yeah. fangs. And those are actually sensors that allow, um, the computer on board to detect changes in like air pressure and direction and things like that that allow it to fly. Uh, so there is a lot of like real world research that I sort of did. And, you know, none of that really, tra- you see it in the end, but um, I'm glad you asked that because uh, that was something that I kind of got to, you know, deep dive on Wikipedia and really figure out like, why does this look like this? And yeah. Why? It's why really I just, important as a I just find that so fascinating. I'm personally just very fascinated by technology and, you know, um, sort of military technology and so um, I knew there was some connection there but um, but yeah thank you for explaining that it's just really sure. cool and, and and I agree the faceted look makes it look really futuristic um, and just contributes to the the sort of the very um, <laughs> just the coolness factor of it for sure yeah <laughs> um, I think everybody would agree um, let me just check some of the comments here too because I haven't really looked in a minute so let's see uh, Um, someone's asking a recent comment uh, for the X-Jet, what's the ratio of time spent in gravity sketch versus fusion? And how did you make the decision as to when to use which? How far can you push gravity sketch before switching? Thanks. That's a, that's a great question. Um, I think it, it kind of will be answered a little bit more. At the time, gravity sketch was still very new to me. So this was like my first VR heavy project. Um, so like I said, they didn't have sub D at the time, which they do now, which was a huge factor, I think, in speeding things up. Basically, I treated, uh, the time I spent in Gravity Sketch was definitely 
I would say maybe 10%, 10, 20%, uh, let's go with 15%, uh, probably of the design time. Uh, it was a lot more in the beginning when I needed to block out shapes. So usually what would happen is I would be, obviously I think a, a couple, of, a little while ago, I showed that first model and that was all done in gravity sketch, just like all the surfaces and planes that I made to make up the exterior. And then I started to build it in CAD. And when you're building in CAD, sometimes you come across problems. You're like, okay, well, where is this edge going to go? So usually I would come up with, I would get to a point where there was so many um, issues I had to problem solve. And then I would say, all right, it's time to jump into VR because for me, VR is almost like sketching over something. And I can say, you know, I can just draw a line real quick and say, okay, that's where I want that line to go, or this needs to be adjusted. So. I would have sort of these lists of things that need to be fixed. And then I would jump into VR and say, okay, how am I gonna fix this? How am I gonna make this work with the CAD that I have? And um, go from there. So what I would do is then kind of put in, I, I look at things a lot of times in primary, secondary and tertiary shapes. So almost all of the primary shapes are being done in VR. Like you can see like up here, this ceiling panel is is was sketched out in VR. And then I'm going in and I'm doing it obviously in VR right now, but um, I'm going in in Fusion and I'm making, uh, you know, the panel that's gonna go in there uh, and sit like that. So it really was just a balancing act. And sometimes, honestly, it was just like, hey, I'm getting bored of looking, um, you know, at my screen, let me actually sit in this and see if I come up with any other ideas or yeah. come up with any design. So there was no rule of like, you know, this problem you know, this thing has to be in VR and vice versa, but uh, it definitely changed, like he's, like I'd shown as I went along to, okay, all of the primary forms are in, now let's get these secondary tertiary details just annotated in VR and uh, make a note of them. So when I go back to the CAD, I sort of have uh, a 3D a checklist of things I can say, oh, here's a problem here. I know there's a problem here because I circled it and I might have written a note or something of what needed to be changed. So uh, yeah. yeah. Is really just the bouncing back and forth was great, and uh, and there was no sort of set rules. I didn't I didn't do like all VR than all CAD. It was just back and forth bouncing um, between the two, and that was really uh, advantageous for me. Well, it's incredible, and um, and uh, you know it seems like a really effective workflow, especially if you want to um, you know end up with something that's very uh, true to life, you know, like, like you've been doing here. I mean, you, I mean, if this thing was built physically, I mean, I'm sure it would, everything would feel right, you know, mm -hmm. because of the time you took going back and forth, making sure everything was positioned correctly, placed correctly. Yeah. Um, and the thing too, is that with the scale of this vehicle, something where you're going inside and out of it, uh, you know, scale is cr critical because you have to be able to stand in it, you know, be able to sit down comfortably all of those things, you don't want people bumping their heads. So like, that's why, you know, this roof is very, uh, like the roof goes like sort of up like this. So someone could actually walk in the middle of the, the aircraft if they needed to and things like that. So um, yeah, it, it was definitely uh, super necessary. So uh, yeah, are there any other questions? If not, I think we should probably jump over to the space suit. Real yes. Quick and kind of review that. Absolutely. Let's jump over to that. I I am okay. curious about this um, last question here. Mm -hmm. Myself. Um, someone said, "What's the reason you chose Fusion over 3D software such as Blender? Fusion usually gets really laggy for me after too many parts, especially with a sci-fi concept model." Yes, it does. Um, there are a couple of things. Uh, Fusion. I, I I started off with SolidWorks and. Um, I really like SolidWorks. SolidWorks is great for if you have a design, like, and you're kind of translating it to 3D. So let's say you have orthographic views and you know you need to manufacture it. It's great for large scale models. And I would say it probably handled, probably would have handled this file a little bit better. But for me, because uh, there were, Fusion is a little bit more freeing in terms of design. I feel like it's a little bit better when you don't know what you're making and you could kind of push and pull things a lot quicker. Mm. And so uh, in regards to the, the issues with fusion handling large assemblies, uh, there are two things that were important. Uh, there's actually a video by a guy named Wintergarden. Uh, 
that uh, he built this marble machine. I don't know if you've seen this video, but it's like this marble machine that plays music, and he built it in Fusion, and he came across the same yeah. error, and um, thousands of parts, thousands of pieces, and he actually has a way to do it where um, Fusion doesn't slow down as much, and basically you just break it into components that are referenced externally, and um, without yeah. getting too technical, if you just search that video, marble machine, Fusion 360 large assembly, you'll get a good breakdown of that. Uh, the other part too is, uh, you know, I invest pretty heavily in my computer and my hardware. So uh, if I get, you know, a big freelance job or something, I might spend, you know, 10, 15% of that income on upgrading my computer. So uh, I'm always trying to make sure, basically you don't want, you know, if your computer is the tool that you use to make your living, you don't want that tool to be holding you back. So yeah. Um, I, I'm always really um, proactive about upgrading things when I can. Um, and so that's that's just something, obviously as a beginner, it's a little bit tougher because maybe you don't have the funds, maybe it's a big commitment to start you know, tinkering with your own computer or whatever, but that was something that um, really helped me. And that was just some you know personal interest of mine since I was young, computers and computer parts. So um, that helps, but I would just say, yeah, there's totally other 3D packages. Uh, that you could use. I actually tried to render this in Blender and uh, uh, my graphics card ran out of VRAM. So I, I was like, okay, I need to graph update my graphics card, but it was at the time where I just wanted to finish. So I ended up rendering this in Keyshot um, because it's CPU based and I had just upgraded my uh, CPU. So uh, yeah, I mean, that's probably a long answer. There's no easy way about it, uh, but there are a few ways. The Winter Garden video on large assemblies and fusion will definitely uh, help you out with uh, getting more longevity if you feel like things are starting to slow down in fusion. Well, thank you for that. It's very insightful and very informative. Um, yeah, there's actually something I was wondering about too. So yeah, thank you for taking the time to explain that. But I guess we're gonna jump right over here to your um, sort of an, another project you've been working on. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you have here is uh, a suit from Alien from the original uh, the original series. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, this project and, and your intent behind it? Sure, so it was after I saw your uh, Boba Fett video, I was really, I finished the Gravity, the uh, X-Jet, and I was like, all right, what's next? And then <laughs> um, I saw you making the Boba Fett helmet and um, I had worked uh, with a company called SCPS Unlimited and uh, they build a lot of costume and wardrobe elements for um, film and TV shows. If you look on their website, you can see some of their old stuff. They did like the um, the uh, interstellar spacesuits. They did the Bane mask. Uh, uh, most recently, they did the uh, black mask from uh, the Harley Quinn movie. And so I really enjoyed um, working there. And while I was working there, we did you know a lot of similar stuff to this. And I was curious, like. I didn't use any VR there, but I was curious, seeing you make the Boba Fett costume, I was like, okay, if you can do that, maybe I can start to get this to a point where things can be sort of worked out in VR and then done in CAD. Um, so this was sort of like testing out how you were doing things, testing out how I would do things. And I just wanted to sort of explore uh, the model. And like I had said at the time, uh, sub D modeling, when I started the XJet wasn't available. And so what I was able to do, almost all of this uh, is sub D, I think like uh, a lot of the major features, some of the, 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 like the ribbon or whatever you would call it here, that's all just, um, the mesh from, uh, the basic tools, but the sub D has been incredibly, uh, useful to me. Uh, yeah. And that does, that takes a little bit of time to get used to and understand sort of how, uh, working in sub, sub D modeling works. But yeah. I think it's, um, it's, it looks sort of simple at the start. But once you kind of see the tools you can use and how you can push them, um, and we'll, we'll get back to that in, in a bit, um, but basically all of these sub D parts, I can start working with in Fusion. Uh, so as before with the XJet, where I sort of used Gravity Sketch to make a, uh, a sketch or, or sort of like a thumbnail version of it, um, now I'm making what is essentially uh, could be final geometry that would be printed. So um, imagine this is, you know, this mannequin in here is a body scan of an actor and we need to build a spacesuit, uh, you know, and these shoulder pieces need to fit their shoulder really well. Or, you know, these chest plates need to have a subtle curve along, you know, that, that character's chest. Yeah. Um, so you could work directly off scan data, build your 3D model, 
and then um, bring that into Fusion. You could start putting points in where you need to put hardware for like screwing in straps, uh, cut out cavities for like electronics. Like, uh, like if these wrist computers uh, in the movie, they have like a screen on them and things and like buttons. So I just modeled the shell in sub D, but now I can uh, go into Fusion and start putting in, you know, features and things like that. So that's one of those things. Sometimes yeah. I see people ask like, oh, like, can you do Booleans and can you do like champers and fillets in, in Gravity Sketch? And like, you can't right now, but in my opinion, uh, like you don't really need to because you, you get the form that you need in here and then you can bring it into a software that um, like Fusion or SolidWorks and get more of the that final um, detail that you yeah. need. So yeah, that's true. It's a really good point. Um, you know, people ask you about booleans a lot and, and chamfers and fillets, and um, you know, we we we've received um, you know a lot a lot of messages like that, and and we would love to have features like that in in Gravity Sketch, but um, just the 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 issue right now really is just the limitations of, of VR and. Mm -hmm. uh, the mathematical computational aspect of it. Not saying yeah. it will never happen, but um, it's just a, it's quite a it's quite a hurdle. And yeah. um, I think you bring up a really cool thing, which is that um, you know Gravity Sketch is, is is really great, you know, because you can block it in, get your forms, and then and then for the Boolean and their more refined sort of ways of working, you know, you can bring it into Blender or Maya or Fusion 360 and really um, really start getting those uh, those tertiary secondary and potentially tertiary details you know? yeah definitely um so yeah this this whole model here nothing was done in fusion this was all uh just limited to gravity sketch and uh i love it, it looks awesome yeah i just wanted to uh just to see how far it could go and this was really quick i mean this was probably i did it over the course of a couple of days but this was probably maybe eight eight hours of work maybe wow. even less yeah. And so, like, you can just do so much so quickly. And, um, you know, there's just, like, uh, you could start posing this. I did a uh, render where I put uh, uh, some a clay shader on it from JAMA. I tried those out. Like, and you can just real quickly get, like, a real rough view of this model. So um, just the speed of it is incredible. And if you needed to do, like, a keyframe or, like, an image or whatever, you could, you could totally do that. So Yeah, um, yeah. I'll, I just, I just want to see this thing in some like you know cinematic uh keyframe renders just I, it would i know it would look so cool yeah i have like like i was already messing around oh wait let me get the uh here hold on like you could do oh hold on. get this mannequin out of here for a second um but like when i was building it uh you could like i kind of built it i was when i was building this i was thinking in terms of like an action figure so yeah. like this arm like is movable here. This is where the joint would be, and like you could move, obviously start moving this stuff. Have this guy like reaching for you know the alien on his head or whatever. Yeah. And um, obviously the arm's not in the correct position right now, but <laughs> um, you know start moving things. So that was like there's a ton of potential with this, and I'm probably gonna do a few renders in uh, Blender just to see like give it like you said more of that cinematic feel. But um, I think now, if there's no other questions, we could jump back and I could show some of the workflow that I've used to um, translate this geometry and this mesh in yeah. Blender. Um, yeah, let's. Um, you? Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Um, it doesn't look like there's any more questions going on uh, related to this, so yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Okay, sounds good. Let's give us a moment, everybody. The thing that you always get after being in VR is you get VR face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So let me go back to sharing my screen here. Okay. So. Are we screen sharing? Is everything good? Yeah, it's all, um, yeah, it's, it's showing up. Okay. Um, so, uh, let's see. One thing I want to touch on, we, we talked about it briefly beforehand, but uh, the render and control mesh. So this is going to be a, maybe a little technical, but I want to just dive a little deep into this for people who maybe 
are they do CAD modeling, they're not aware of it, or they're just um, they just want to get more details. Uh, so, and I, yeah, not to get too deep, but with sub D modeling, um, there's kind of two versions. Uh, there's the low poly, and this is what you can do in Gravity Sketch. You can toggle that low poly setting, and what that low poly setting in Fusion essentially is is unsubdivided mesh. And then when you turn off low poly with your subdivision on, you have your render mesh, essentially. That's kind of a simplification. But um, I'm just showing here, right now I have control mesh. And then when I go back to render mesh. So these are two settings when you export from Fusion. And I just in, imported these into Fusion through the insert mesh command. You can import OBJ. And the great thing with the gravity sketch files is because uh, it's sub D and it's in quads, Fusion can convert that file into a solid uh, geometry that you can work with. So let me just go, for example, for this risk computer. So this is the original file from there. And I think this is the, let's see, I believe this is the control mesh. And all you can do, so you make your design in gravity sketch, you say, okay, I like how this looks. Um, maybe you looked at a scan data or uh, you had some reference and you know, the, cur the curve of this was really critical for sitting properly on um, the user's wrist. And what you would do is uh, go to utilities, convert. And what you're converting from is a quad mesh to T-splines. And so once you do that, oh wait, hold on, sorry. Uh, all right, now it'll work. Uh, once you do that, you're gonna get this file. And you can see it kind of changed a little wow. bit from here to here. Yeah. But what, what this just changed to was your render mesh that you had before. So you could see um, you could see the geometry is still there. I think it might actually be slightly different. And this could be just, just due to how it's subdividing, how T-splines is subdividing versus gravity sketch, but yeah. really like it's not that much um, different. Yeah. So it's now- a smooth, it's kind of a smooth version, subdivided. It's basically like a, just a subdivided version of, the, of what was there before. Exactly. So now you have um, this risk computer and uh, there's a lots of things you could do with this, but basically, um, now that you have this, you can, uh, there's a couple different things. First of all, I didn't model a backside to this, which would have made this a little bit easier to make it a solid shape. But inside of Fusion, you can do, um, now I'm going to go T-splines to body representation. And now this is a surface. And you can take the surface. And I'm just kind of glossing over this real quick, but I'm just patching it. And then I'm stitching these two together. And so now you might be saying, okay, so what? This looks the same as what it was before. However, now you just turned your mesh into CAD data and you can now do all the normal CAD operations that you could do with a file. So let's take uh, this and real quickly, let's just say this was like a button. And I'm just for the sake of time, I'm not gonna like go in and really get this perfect, but um, let's just say this was a button on here and I'm gonna Boolean these two together. Now they're joined. Now I can start doing operations on this, blending it, doing things like that. Um, things like that. So let's That's say awesome. you wanted, yeah, let's say you wanted to put electronics in here. You know, you can start cutting out the cavity for your circuits and wires and things, LEDs and all of that, and position that so that it works. And again, because you worked off of that geometry, whether it was scan data, in this case, we're just working off of a mannequin, um, it'll fit. So I have a few other just like examples here of, um, this was like the shoulder piece. This is the shoulder piece subdivided in Blender. And as you can see, you know, it's, this, it's virtually the same as your rendering and um, you know, you can go from there, work off of that. And so, yeah, this was really like, when I first kind of figured this out, it was kind of eye-opening because you don't see many, I don't see a lot of people, I'm sure people are doing it, but I don't see a lot of people going from uh, like polygonal modeling mesh 
to solid um, solid bodies like you can do in infusion. Yeah. So this is really really powerful stuff that um, well someone who's maybe not as technically knowledge this yeah. might not seem that crazy, but um, just for me like connecting all of these dots is really huge. And um, like the last thing was like this sort of like hip computer that they have here. Same thing. I brought it in. I closed up the backside, which allowed me to change it to uh, a solid body. And now you can start, um, you know, you can start putting details in here and uh, chopping it up. You can do all of the traditional CAD operations that you could do within uh, SolidWorks or Fusion, but you're doing it off of uh, geometry. Like that would be pretty. This would, you know, be pretty time-consuming to create all of this straight from scratch in here. Yeah. So, um, especially too, like. Again, if this is something that's really far away or you're not really going to see it, if you're just doing like a render, uh, you know, you can just break things up, put, you know, turn this into a light, things like that, and uh, really start going from there. So, um, yeah. yeah, I did the same thing with the chest plate here. Like you could start to adjust things, put hardware in for like these straps to attach to. And um, yeah, it's uh, the possibilities are pretty endless. But yeah, you can see here. I'm gonna hide, these are all the original files and then start to get some, like a solid shape. And you could 3D yeah. print this. <laughs> you could put, you know, your bosses back here for hardware that's gonna screw into the straps, run, you know, whatever you need to, to check things out and make sure things are working uh, virtually. So that kind of, I probably went over that a little quick, but if someone has questions, uh, feel free to, to reach out if they need more like technical help on getting this to work. But um, for me, uh, this this is huge for for just making going from Gravity Sketch to CAD really easily and uh, it like I said it's almost a one to one translation and uh, yeah it's it's a, it's just a great workflow I I mean when I was in school I was um, combining Gravity Sketch and Fusion with some of my projects and not that Fusion's the is the one answer but mm -hmm. Fusion's mesh editing and sculpting environments I think really lend themselves well to this this way of working of converting yeah. from sub D to, and then just immediately going right in doing the boolean operations all of the extra details like you've just shown us here um, mm -hmm. so yeah I I definitely recommend Fusion 362 highly um, to anybody that wants to, to get into CAD especially if you're a hobbyist or um, you know individual um, you know modeler and you, you don't you're not you're not making things that are you know need need to be production level like for manufacturing uh, which you mm -hmm. could do some of that as well in fusion 360 but um, yeah. i think that's also why it's so popular in the in the sort of the individual space uh, individual designer artist um, because it gives you the power of you know um uh, of, of basically you know working with nerves working with um you know these more like cat traditional cad tools um, and going straight to 3D printing, and um, yeah, it's just it's just so cool to see the, yeah. the to, to see the tie into the workflow workflow between mm -hmm. these these two programs. And, yeah, and like the other thing too for me, I, I personally I find this like sub D modeling inside of Fusion, it's not as intuitive because you know you move the camera and like from a front view, let's say you're designing something and you're like, oh yeah, like you know that looks good, and then you go to the side and you're like, oh I didn't want that, and um, so it's just much easier when, when you're virtually in this space as opposed to working off of a screen. And um, just real quickly, just to show like, uh, like when you go into box mode, this is essentially that low poly mode that you get inside of Gravity Sketch. So I just want to try to like connect the dots for anyone watching and say like, you know, I, I really see these um, these tools as like great like a great sort of like balance of. Um, from my perspective, I'm going to probably be doing most of my sub D modeling in VR. And then like I've shown, bringing it in and doing more of the detailed stuff. Cause to me, this is a little bit more challenging to have to select a vertex and move it. And, and, and really it can kind of get tedious and, and not very fun. And in gravity sketch, it's, it's a lot more, um, just fun, I suppose. So, uh, so yeah, that's, that's a big takeaway. Obviously you found this, this really cool workflow. What would you say is like an ultimate like workflow of of um, having the speed and intuition that VR brings, but also the almost kind of like the finalness and 
execution, uh, executionable. <laughs> that's probably I don't know if that's even a word, but uh, you know, executable. I guess um, mm -hmm. geometry that you get from from fusion. Yeah, no, I mean, honestly, like it, it's kind of. I, I really like how it is now. I'm sure there'll be more changes. I would like to see um, uh, maybe in Gravity Sketch a little bit more expansion of the sub D stuff. But again, mm -hmm. like I know, uh, like a couple things, maybe like a thicken tool would be really cool. Yeah. Um, but, uh, or actually, there was one thing uh, local mirroring. And I kind of figured out a workaround for this. But let's say. Like, let's say I wanted the shoulder piece to be symmetrical. Mm -hmm. The way to do it in Gravity Sketch right now is you would build it along your original mirror line. And then if you move it to the proper position, it's still mirroring. Mm -hmm. But then once you bake the mirroring and put it on the other side, then that mirroring is gone. So I'd love it if there was a way to keep mirroring here. Like, so like this would be our line of symmetry here. Mm -hmm. And then there would also be a mirrored version of all of this on the other side. Yeah, uh, but that like again, it's there's a workaround for it, and it, in my opinion, does a good enough job, and um, yeah, so like it takes a little bit of planning. Yeah, it takes a little bit of planning, and once you kind of get do it once, you'll understand it. But um, in terms of like like the workflow, I really think like that sort of gravity sketch to fusion, and then like let's say you bring this into Blender, um, you know that for someone who's just starting out, that is like. I can't think of much things you couldn't do with that. Maybe there's a few like um, polygonal sort of tools that you can't really access or you would have to create in Blender. But for the most part, um, yeah, it's really like, I can't like it to me that those, that sort of workflow and those software will um, sort of be able to do almost like 99% of everything you need to do. So um, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that, that thing you said about thickness, that's something that we get a lot um, as far mm -hmm. as like being able to thicken um, sub-D surfaces. And, yeah, um, thicken or even like a flatten would be cool. Mm. Uh, yeah. I know that's in, yeah, that's in here. Like, so if you take all these points, now it will start to average them out. And like now I have a flat surface. And that what that would be useful for is if I go to convert this, now I could have like a flat plane that I could work off of. But yeah. Again, like I like I'm not by no means complaining. I think the tool is already like really powerful. Uh, it's just like those are some minor things that yeah, absolutely. That these are did. these are things that we just love to hear from um, people that use not only Gravity Sketch but just other programs. You know, because it's mm -hmm. um, you know we want to we want to know what's what's going to be useful. You know, in the pipeline. You know, yeah, um, and. Uh, you know, because we know that Gravity Sketch is, and Gravity Sketch is never meant to be an end-all, be-all, um, yeah. one-stop sort of shop for um, all 3D projects. And so we want the tools to fit um, in with the pipeline of, of other of other tools out there. And you know, mm -hmm. surface thickness is one that's come up a lot, and I think uh, the team is definitely um, interested in making that happen. As far as a timeline, can't really really say, but. Um, it's definitely one that uh, I think a lot of people agree would be really useful. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's uh, it's just again I know I've said it many times, but it's just really cool to see sort of your workflow, and it's I think it's inspiring as well um, to like uh, you know I think for me personally, you know I want to I want to take some of the stuff I've made in Gravity Sketch and take it even further, and whether it's Fusion or Blender, and, and maybe like three D print it, you know, and mm -hmm. um, I think that's like some of the exciting next step stuff you can do and um there's so many applications right so many so many workflows but uh yeah um and yeah and then somebody here in the comments they said you know i've been able to use models that i make in gravity sketch and go into zbrush for finer details so another Absolutely. perfect example yeah. another powerful tool that you can um, use in the pipeline uh, with definitely gravity sketch yeah and, yeah the um, uh ZBrush, I, I've used ZBrush a little bit. It is just not my software of choice, yeah. but um, I know some people are doing phenomenal things with it. So like looking at this alien, like this is something I would totally love to take into like ZBrush and really start getting more more detail in. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's crazy how, how things are working. And uh, yeah, I, I too, like I, I love watching just other people like working on, you know, their workflows because to me, it's super interesting just to see like, you know, 
I'm using like if we're using the same tools, how are we using it differently, and what I can learn from someone using it differently? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I'll find more efficiencies in the way they do it. Maybe I can show them, you know, ways that I would do things that would be easier for them. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty crazy, like seeing how other people work and uh, what their their methods are. So um, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ryan, for, for showing all of this uh, process and, and your tools um, and, and your workflow, your thinking behind everything. It's been very informative and uh, educational to myself and I know the people watching as well. Um, if I could ask uh, what's next for you, are you working on anything uh, right now or in the near future uh, uh, that you, that you can share moment, about? I don't have, I, I, my goal right now is to get this project a little bit more finalized. Um, like you had said, maybe do some cinematic renders. I kind of want to explore more of that this sort of workflow and uh, things like that. Uh, on top of that, I, I've been working freelance, so just just trying to stay busy. Um, I've been doing some entertainment design work, which that whole industry had kind of shut down since COVID, but that has um, since been like re uh, starting back up again. So I'm kind of excited to see um, where that's going to lead and what kind of opportunities that'll lead to. So. Uh, yeah, I've just been just been working on uh, freelance work and then uh, whatever I can find. Uh, if anyone's interested, I did uh, a recent project with a company called Radiant Nuclear, and uh, they're building a micro reactor, which is uh, provides uh, clean nuclear energy, and it's small, so it's uh, portable, so you can move it to areas of the earth where maybe there's not enough sunlight for solar, and uh, you don't have to bring gasoline and diesel to charge generators. So that's something that's uh, really exciting and I'm hoping that uh, that sort of takes off. Uh, but yeah, other than that, I'm keep working. Uh, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> well, great. Um, if anybody wants to uh, see more of Ryan's work, um, go and follow him on Instagram. Um, I think it's uh, ryn.dsn. Uh, underscore D -E -S -N. Underscore D E S N. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and we've also linked, you know, we're, we're, we're linking all this stuff in this description for this video too. So feel free to go and check that out. Sure. Also, you can check out Ryan at um, ryansepper.com, www.ryansepper.com, uh, and, um, mm -hmm. and also your art station as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, most of the stuff on the website will be more, the website and art station is more complete, and then the art station will have more, have like work in progress shots, time lapses, um, just more random stuff. So. Not, I wouldn't say less professional, but it's just not as like a, a complete portfolio. Uh, but yeah, awesome. uh, in closing, I just wanted to really quickly uh, yep. thank, there's been like a ton of sort of uh, educational resources that have really helped me. And so mm. if there's anyone out there looking uh, to learn more, I would say uh, I got a ton of help from uh, the Brainstorm School in Burbank, California. I know that's more local, so you can't really do that remote, but uh, Learn Squared as well. A lot of my fusion work, uh, I learned from their lessons. Um, uh, Daniel Park, uh, he goes by Hyperlink. Uh, his Fusion 360 class was really great. So uh, there's just a ton of people, artists that I reach out to along the way for like the XJet project that gave me feedback. So all of those people helped out a lot. I just want to give you know some recognition to them, thank them. and. Uh, yeah, I was always amazing when you send emails to people and say, hey, can you help me out with this or give me some feedback and, and you actually get a reply. So um, <laughs> there's a ton of people uh, that have done that. So for anyone who's trying to learn more, get better, I would definitely say, you know, contact artists or people doing projects that you look up to, reach out to them. And uh, you might be surprised how, uh, how well you're able to, to improve from just talking to people or are taking on one class and things like that. So, And um, I'll add to that and say that uh, I think you'll be surprised at how receptive and how open people in the community uh, in the art co and design community are to giving feedback and, and talking to you. So Definitely. that's something yeah. that I've personally experienced as well. Yeah, if anyone's got any questions, if I kind of went over things quickly, I know we had a lot to sort of cover in the time allotted, uh, feel free to email me, reach out on Instagram or whatever. And uh, yeah, I'll try to try to get to it all. But uh, well, yeah. If, I just want to say before we're before we're done, is there any parting advice that you want to give uh, as a as a designer to to the people watching and who will be watching uh, after um, this is over? Yeah, I, I would say just keep learning. Uh, that's something that I have really sort of always um, been important to me is always learn new tools, new workflows, and that's not to say that can become a slippery slope where. Um, 
sometimes there's this like trend of like this new software is like sort of the flavor of the month and like everyone's sort of jumping on it. Uh, I would say really look at the jobs that you want to do, the people who you, the artists you look up to, look at the tools that they're using and try to use what they're using. Because at the end of the day, if you're going to get hired and you want to work with those people, um, you need to know how to how to use their tools and their workflows. So uh, just always be learning, you know, always be trying out something something new and challenging. Uh, the XJet was insanely challenging for me. I had a lot of doubt along the way, but I would say like you really have to, you know, come up with a vision of what you want to get done with it and um, keep working on it. And uh, yeah, I, I would say too, I also like uh, the fact that I, I do freelance, so I have a lot of different subject matter. Um, I think sometimes designers could get maybe stuck uh, at a company that maybe only does like one thing. And so now you're like, maybe good at designing water bottles and things like that. But when you start to look at like a car or something, you maybe would think that's impossible. So I'd say always just challenge yourself with things that interest you. Always be interested in what you're working on. Because uh, if you're not interested, you're not going to have the discipline to keep working on it and just, um, you know, learn the tools of the trade. And uh, yeah, I'll, basically always, always keep learning, always keep challenging yourself to improve. And uh, that way you'll always be sort of in demand or or have potential in the uh, in the workforce. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. It's great advice, Ryan. Um, thank you, everybody that's been watching. And um, if you missed any of it, uh, this will be available as soon as the live is over. So um, feel free to go watch back through the beginning if you missed it. Um, and make sure to uh, tune in on, on Thursdays. We're always interviewing people from the art and design community. So um, tune in and, uh, and and learn something new. So. I uh, just want to thank you again, Ryan, for your time and for going through everything that you've shown us today. It's been very, very eye-opening and inspiring as well. So thank you very much. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah, this is a great opportunity to, to be on here. So, yeah. All right. Well, bye, everybody. Thank you very much for joining and have a good rest of your week.